It's 2023 and you actually have a lot of different options if you want to play an MMORPG. Now granted, most of those MMOs that you have to pick from are at least 5, 10, or 25 years old, but there's still choices to make. There are MMOs that are still very social and make you want to group up and play with friends, and there are other MMOs that are the complete opposite end of the spectrum that really make you just want to play by yourself, and that is a completely fine way to play MMOs. I have found that out after not believing it to be the way, you know, after a year or so of content creation. There are also MMOs that are actually very light on combat, and then MMOs that let you sit back as a cow and appreciate art or poetry. Let's run through some of the MMOs that you could be playing today and break them down into different subgenres like social MMO, single player MMO, cow MMO, and then we can go that way and add, give three things that are fantastic about the game and one thing that f***ing sucks. And believe me when I say that some of these MMOs on this list, because honestly, it's, it's not a list for me, it's a list for you, so I don't necessarily have to like all the games in this list. Some of them, it was a little bit of a struggle to only put one bad thing. But if I miss some of your favorite MMOs, please put them down in the comment section below. Let people know why they should give that game a try, because ultimately we're all trying to find a new world to inhabit and enjoy. And I need to crowdsource this help from you all sometimes. We'll start with the social MMORPG. It is the type of MMO that really excels when you're able to group and raid with friends. For the purpose of this video, it doesn't have to be completely reliant on being social to play. Instead, the key factor is that it is improved by playing with others. It of course has to start with EverQuest. It is the primary choice here. In fact, it might be able to hold this entire category by itself. It remains the single MMO I can think of that works best if you are social. The downside to that is if you are playing solo, it's going to feel much more hollow and perhaps even disappointing. EverQuest first launched in 1999 and has been going strong since, but it's far from its glory days from 1999 to 2004, when it reigned supreme over the Western MMO market. From heights of close to 600,000 players back then, it now hovers around 80,000 or so from the last time we heard anything about numbers on the game back in 2020. It is very far from a populous MMO, but it's still MMO royalty, so you can't really just throw it out. And for fans of P99, the offshoot of EverQuest, don't worry, we will get to P99 not in this section, and you'll see why. Here are three great things about EverQuest and one bad. Social, of course, I mean, that is that is the, the main draw of EverQuest. When I brought in new people to play the game recently, the social aspect was the part that they enjoyed most, playing together, working together, and the fact that the game kind of pushes you towards that. Second is going to be that it's tactical tab combat. When I say tactical tab combat, I'm not saying it's as tactical as, say, Baldur's Gate 3, which is going to be making you really think things through. But EverQuest is a slower paced game that makes you think of things in sequence. It makes you think when to use certain spells, when they're going to wear off, and how to reapply them. It makes you stack certain things in orders, and it's actually really something you have to con you consider. And by doing that, you also have to consider how many things you're fighting at once. You're not going to be wanting to pull mass hordes of mobs. It's going to be a quick, fast death for you. So don't do it just one at a time, unless you have an enchanter or bard, which is the fourth role in EverQuest of the Quaternity, the CC or support class. EverQuest is one of the best games for these four roles. Does that count as an extra bonus? I'm going to give EverQuest an extra bonus good thing anyway. I'm, I'm winging it. That shit isn't in, even in the script. But the Quaternity is really freaking cool. You have your tank, you have your healer, you have your DPS, and you have your bard and, and enchanter. The people that, that give you mana regen and the people that lock down mobs. Quick note, me from the future here, I got so into talking about the Quaternity that I didn't actually mention my third thing that I thought was great in EverQuest, which is the deep lore and story. EverQuest is a fantastic game for building up lore. While the story gets a little, little weird at times, the lore of the story itself and the, the way that it is interwoven into the world is exceptional. That is pretty bad, to be honest, with EverQuest. It's old as f**k. 
fuck. And that heavily contributes to a population gap in content between low and high level, which makes a lot of this incredible content in the game either has something you have to kind of solo or just outright skip with power leveling. In the live game in certain progression servers that have Seeds of Destruction unlocked as an expansion, which is a later expansion, you get mercenaries and the mercenaries will help you level faster, but it's still a bit rough and it's still a bit lonely at times. The, the, the gap in population and the lack of population is a major issue for EverQuest and will continue to be. Now this next one, <laughs> this next one I might get some hate on. Spe not, not for having it in this list. I think I would get hate if I didn't have it in the list, but I might get hate for including it as my second social MMO. World of Warcraft. Before you rush to the comment section and tell me how wrong I am, let me let me get my whole thoughts out and, and explain my thought process here. And then then you can tell me just how wrong I am. After all, the social MMO is kind of a dying breed, so the entries here are going to have some asterisks. I first played World of Warcraft in its beta and hated it. I next picked it up with Burning Crusade and Wrath of the Lich King. By then, it was already trending toward being solo friendly. Questing, which is the primary function of the game and key to leveling, is a solitary activity. So I don't want to misrepresent the game as being overly social. A lot of what you're going to be doing in game is solo. That said, the game really thrives when you engage in more difficult grouping and raiding content with your guild and friends. Like EverQuest, at this point in its lifespan, it kind of relies on you having a friend group in place or finding a guild, but you can make World of Warcraft social, and doing so has a lot of benefits. World of Warcraft's best gear and best experience are still firmly in the social camp. It means to get the most of the game, you're going to have to work with others or compete against them in PvP. And the highest level of both of these activities requires you to actually be a little bit social and communicate. However, if you want a little bit of help getting into those social situations as well, Group Finder lets you have an anti-social social experience. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but if you're more familiar with lobby-based games, it's easier to get into than forming up for your own groups manually. I just really still push for you to join a guild in World of Warcraft. Find some friends and experience it together. If you do, you'll find an MMO with immense amount of content, responsive controls, a huge expansive story, accessible PvP, and hell, Dragon Riding is just fun, okay? It's one of the best things WoW has added as a feature in years in my opinion. Flying in the game used to feel like a joyless chore that actually shrunk down the world and made it feel too small. But Dragon Riding feels suitably interactive and limited, and they plan to move it around and, and expand it to more of the game, older parts of the game. So here are three great things and one bad thing about World of Warcraft. It is easy to pick up and play. There's not a whole lot to it there. You just open up the game and start playing and it will tell you. And it has a very good tutorial at this point with the Exile Island. It has shit tons of content to play through. I mean, it has so, so much content to play through. Now, granted, they did do a level squish, which limits how much content there actually is now. But if you keep going through alts and things like that, it does still feel the same way. It has responsive tab target combat that has a lot of movement. So if EverQuest is a little too stationary for you, but you still like tab combat, then World of Warcraft is a really good middle ground between EverQuest and more recent games that are much more active. World of Warcraft just has good feeling combat. The bad part for me is going to be the degradation of difficulty from the earlier days of World of Warcraft, making it feel a bit more like Diablo 4, gathering up hordes of NPCs and murdering them all in one final fell blow. At least before the most recent Diablo 4 patch, that is. Sorry, is that... Is that too soon? World of Warcraft has expanded its single player story in recent years, but I still feel like it falls way behind these next two games in that department. So let's take a look at some of the MMORPGs that have the best 
most emotional, impactful single player story of any MMORPGs out there. I don't think these will be too surprising. Final Fantasy XIV is hot off the heels of their new expansion announcement. They have the MMO community buzzing again, and there might be nothing this MMO is known for better than its single player story. It is routinely held up as a gem of the game, with the story being top of the list. So of course it has to be in this section. It is also much more than that. It's a beautiful game that plays very well. Like World of Warcraft, it's responsive with combat, having a satisfying input to reaction. For me personally, I love the combo system of the Samurai class, and this game lets you really explore all the different classes or jobs by accessing them all in a single character. However, there are some issues if you like the faster pace of World of Warcraft. Final Fantasy XIV seems to take a step back with their global cooldown, which has been an issue for some people in the past, but it also means that it's it kind of allows some, for more tactics and thought. It has your normal PvE focus as well, with raids, groups, quests, and so on. I personally think it's lagging in PvP, but otherwise it is a top tier, if not the best MMO on the market for a reason, and the story is honestly the reason for it, and it has so much content, and if you want to play Final Fantasy XIV, you can basically play for hundreds of hours without spending a dime because the trial that they have is now set all the way up until Stormblood as soon as the new expansion comes out. So that means you're going to be getting the base game, the first expansion and the second expansion, all for just basically downloading the game. So it really gives you the opportunity to jump in and try it. And it's not like a free to play game or something like that. It actually is the game. So there are still some limitations, but it's still a very, very generous trial. So I've kind of already talked about it, but here are the three good things about the MMO and one that really sucks. Like World of Warcraft, it is easy to pick up and play. It brings you along slowly. It may not have quite as good a tutorial as World of Warcraft does, but it's also a pretty simple game when you start out, so it makes a lot of sense. And apart from anything else, it does tend to have a pretty kind community. Of course, it also has tons of deep and engaging story content, which will take you through most of the game. It also has other ways to level, like doing fates, which are essentially large public quests and different things to, to really pull you along. Crafting is interesting as well. It's just a fully fleshed out MMORPG. And kind of a little bonus here, the tutorial, while it may not be quite as good as World of Warcraft, there is one place that I think it does really well. It teaches you how to play in a group. In fact, that's a big part of the tutorial is just teaching you how your class works and how to do it as a group. It is an optional tutorial. You don't actually have to do it, but you get some really cool gear if you do. So go ahead and do that tutorial. The worst part of Final Fantasy XIV for me is not the global cooldown. It is not the reliance on single player quests. I mean, that's what the game is here for. It is the fact that the PVP to me is absolute shit. It just feels wrong. It feels tacked on like they didn't know what they were doing. And so they just threw some stuff on the wall. They have tried over years to kind of fix this in a way by pulling away from your in game stats and your in game skills and actually giving you a completely different set of PVP skills, which can be very, very confusing, but it likes to it simplifies it. It takes all of your multiple combos and puts them in single macro keys. So it does make it a little bit easier, but even when it's simple, it feels just kind of off. It feels just kind of like it's just not designed for it. So everything feels like it takes too long to get to players. The, the time to kill feels a little off, but just everything about it is just not great. So if you like PvP, I would not recommend Final Fantasy XIV to scratch that itch. World of Warcraft can be much better in that regard. I bet with this next one, there's a handful that you could pick. My choice for the second MMO for story is going to be Elder Scrolls Online. Now, full disclosure here for Elder Scrolls Online, I was recently given a key to try out their new expansion. I have notified that down in the comment section as well, but they didn't like with that key, it didn't have to say anything nice about the game. And in fact, there's still a lot of things I don't like about Elder Scrolls Online. But one thing I really do like is their story and their side quests and the fact that it's fully voiced. 
Elder Scrolls Online could fit under a few different categories here from PVP to value with a mere $10, usually less getting you access to a lot of content in the game. Not as much as Final Fantasy XIV, but still a lot. Throw in the subscription and you get all of the DLC of which there is a ton as long as you keep the subscription active. With a lot of free to play models out there, there's a there's downright deceptive, relying on tactics to hook you early and forcing payments to advance. ESO offers you a full RPGs worth of gameplay for less than the monthly sub. And that's where the game really shines to me. I have issues with several parts of it, like I was saying, mostly it's social features, grouping, combat, etc. But the one thing I absolutely love in ESO is the questing. Fully voiced with branching storylines and deep interwoven plots that engage you. So much has been said about Final Fantasy XIV's storyline, but I don't think enough is said about ESOs and how great those quests are. They are a far cry from the usual fetch and kill quests, though they do have those. If you listen to the voice acting or read the quest text, you won't be disappointed. The disappointment will come when you run a dungeon and you basically just have to run through the entire dungeon because it's too easy, even on veteran. On that note, let's talk about the three great things about ESO and one bad. Like there's a theme here where <laughs> it's easy to pick up and play. It kind of is. Elder Scrolls Online is a very easy game to just pick up and play. It's got a limited skill set when you start and it makes it kind of simple to get through. It has tons of deep engaging story content, especially side quests and the fact that it's all fully voiced makes it very immersive if you take the time to enjoy it. And a broad expansive world that begs to be explored with things to find everywhere you go from quests to gear to new dungeons and skill points, almost to the point where at times it feels a little overwhelming. Now in this negative one, I could have talked about dungeons, I could have talked about the combat, which I really, really do not like the combat in Elder Scrolls Online. I know for some people it's fantastic, but not for me. I guess I kind of am talking about these things, but the, the, <laughs> the bad thing that I really want to talk about is the agnostic leveling. Agnostic level content makes the game feel at times just kind of too accessible. Like a key point being fighting a dragon at level two. It devalues the leveling process while still making the leveling process essential. There are other negatives, but I think this is the negative that is most unique to ESO because it mingles with vertical progression and horizontal agnostic leveling. Seems like two systems that don't necessarily work well together. But I guess at the very least, it does let you play the story however you want to play the story. It just kind of, to me, devalued the process of leveling up. Speaking of devaluing and valuing, that's a terrible, that's a, that is an awful transition to talk about monetary value. But that's what we're going to talk about now. That's the the uh, worst transition I've ever done. But talking about value in MMOs and getting a lot of game for your buck. And some of the ones we've already talked about, especially Elder Scrolls Online and Final Fantasy 14, they could have definitely fit here but I've got two other ones for you. Guild Wars 2, like Elder Scrolls Online, could fit under many of these categories, so I had to find one to fit it under, and value just made sense. As a buy-to-play game, Guild Wars 2 provides a wealth of content for the price of admission, with hybrid action tab combat, world PvP, structured PvP, a deep and emotional personal story, responsive gameplay, there is just a lot to like about Guild Wars 2. It has some of the best seasonal events of the MO genre as well. For example, I'm a huge fan of the jumping puzzles in Guild Wars 2, despite the fact that I am absolute shit at them. But they're still fun, even if you're not good, and just continue to cycle through them over and over again. I think what pushed me to put Guild Wars 2 into the value section right now is the kind of sales they're running right now in you know as they lead up to their their new expansion that's launching in august of 2023 they're currently selling the base game which actually you can kind of get for free now with the three expansions they currently have released for only 49.99 when i say only i mean it's basically the cost of a normal expansion for a lot of these games and the value of never having a subscription not even an optional subscription that's going to try and encourage you to to, to subscribe to the game like in elder scrolls online where you do feel the need to or in Final Fantasy 14 where you eventually do need to subscribe to keep playing, Guild Wars 2 is giving you basically everything just for buying the game. And you know what? It's never too late to jump into the game that World of Warcraft stole dragon riding from. 
I had to get that in there somewhere, right? Here are three great things about Guild Wars 2 and one bad. You get rewarded for exploring with experience flowing from varieties of sources. Just exploring the game is fun <laughs> and useful. It has tons of deep and engaging story content. It really could have fit in the single player story part of the MMO list here. It has more focus on horizontal progression, which means you can engage in more content without gear grinding from PvE to PvP. In this sense, the horizontal part of it is a key part of the game. While they have moved away from it a little bit more in, in recent expansions, it was still a key tenant of the game, and you can tell that the game was built that way. Trills Online added agnostic leveling later in the game's lifespan. Guild Wars 2 was kind of planned around that idea. You like it, it just feels right. You're vertical until max level and then it becomes a bit more horizontal. But things like PvP, structured PvP specifically, it's always horizontal. You just basically go and play. For many players, the negative may be that it actually has an in-game store. I have seen that as a complaint about Guild Wars 2 among really not many complaints about Guild Wars 2. For me though, I'm going to go with direction. I just kind of like said it as a pro, but I'm gonna talk about horizontal progression as being both pro and con here. Much like Elder Scrolls Online, because of the lack of vertical progression, in some instances, I can make the game feel boring and aimless, at least for me. And it does, like I said, have more instances of vertical than it used to, but it still feels a little bit aimless at times, unless you're following the story. Now, this next one may not seem like value at its face because it is actually pretty aggressively monetized. We're going to talk about Lord of the Rings Online. Until Amazon brings us whatever the hell they're making, there is only one virtual world to visit Tolkien's esteemed work, and that's Lord of the Rings Online by Standing Stone Games. A lovingly crafted MMO. Lord of the Rings Online is a solid tab target MMO that has a lot in common with games like World of Warcraft, with questing being the heart of its experience, but at least the quests are very interesting, if perhaps not quite on the level of some other MMOs like Elder Scrolls Online and Guild Wars 2. They're still lore rich and story heavy and will take you to places you know if you're familiar with Tolkien's works. It does show its age, especially in its UI and server lag, but it hits some notes few other MMOs today do. As a free to play player, it will hurl advertisements for subscriptions at you, which can get very frustrating but you will get a tremendous amount of content essentially for free, especially since in previous years they've opened up huge swaths of previously buy to play content DLCs, essentially quests, for free. That said, the model has some similarities with ESO where it exploits purposeful pain points in the game to open up your wallet, like inventory space, quests, and the ability to ride mounts. There is at least a way in game to earn some of the real world purchase currency, so there is a workaround here. You do deeds in the game and you get that currency, slowly but surely, so you don't actually have to pay for it unless you want to speed up the process a lot. Here are three great things and one not so great about Lord of the Rings Online. It is a faithful recreation of Tolkien's world with a beautiful setting, music, and atmosphere. It has classes with defined roles in combat, something that has kind of fallen out of favor in a lot of places where you actually feel like you have a designed role of what to do when you're in a group or in a raid. And this is kind of a newer one, but I'm very excited about it with Lord of the Rings Online. They added new ability to increase the difficulty of quests for overland zones or better rewards, letting you kind of pick how you want to play. It's a bit more like a Diablo type world tier difficulty. It's the kind of thing I wish a lot more MMOs would do, and I think it's something very special to Lord of the Rings Online. Now for this, there were a few negatives to choose from, but for me, it's going to be the UI. The UI is over the lag and, and different things like that because it just feels so damn old. It just hurts. The UI hurts more than even EverQuest's old UI. It just, ah, oh, it's aggravating. There's no other real way to put it. It's just a very aggravating thing. And I, you know, other people will have different negatives, but for me, that negative is the UI. But a lot of these games so far, a lot of them have been talking about tab combat. What about something a bit more action oriented, a bit more exciting for people? Well, this is the section that if World of Warcraft didn't upset you about this video, then this one probably will. 
because we're going to talk about two games that are kind of controversial. If you want fast paced combo combat and perhaps the most beautiful world of any MMO out there, Black Desert Online is the game for you. I personally have some issues with its monetization model. I think a lot of people have issues with its monetization model. It's really struggling with how they put so much appearance gear behind their shop, and it's definitely one of the more grindy MMOs, and they encourage you to spend money to make it less grindy. And that's not even talking about the whole ghillie suit issue, which was providing a bonus in PvP, essentially, but moving on, because that's there's that's a whole other thing. The combat in Black Desert Online and the graphics are the two things that have always stood out the most to me. It is, like I said, an absolutely beautiful game, and the combat is a combo based action style combat that really feels like an action RPG or a, even at times like almost like a fighting game. If you're coming from a tab target game like EverQuest or World of Warcraft, BDO is going to take a lot of like all adjustments, a lot of getting used to. But at the very least, BDO has a low cost to entry, making it almost free to play with costs as little as $1 during sales. And you'll get plenty of content with the game. Just be sure to turn the music up because it's pretty damn good. And of course, the graphics, which talking about that, let's talk about three great things about BDO and one that's awful. The combat, of course, is going to be the first one. Even if the combos can be overwhelming at first, it just feels satisfying in a way some other MMOs don't, from the sound design of the combat to the way it just flows together. Next is going to be the graphics. The game is just gorgeous. I remember when they upgraded their graphics a few years ago, I just kind of sat there like, but why? You're already there. You already have the best graphics of any MMO, but they're like, you know what? Screw it. We're going to be even better with graphics, and that's kind of what they did. It's a beautiful game. Third is going to be that kind of link to the combat, but each class has its own unique playstyle, which kind of makes you want to try them all out. They are gender locked classes, which can be very frustrating for some players, myself included, but they do have different unique playstyles. They all kind of like, you know, basically like combo together, lots of different attacks, but they just look pretty different. Now, the negative. I have to do two things. I have to I have to tie I have to tie two things together. There's the grind and the potential pay to win elements. Many reviews about BDO will talk about how much of a grind it gets towards the end and, and how there are ways to put money into the game to gain an advantage over other players. And in a game that has a heavy focus on PvP, that is a huge issue. Pay to win is doubly frustrating, even if it's a small and diminishing returns, if you are dealing with getting an advantage over other players, or more likely having a disadvantage to players that have paid more, not just put in more time. Although I guess it would technically be you're getting a disadvantage both ways. But at least the music is really good. And speaking of music, New World. New World went from an overhyped, soulless MMO to an underrated MMO that has had a lot of work put into it over the last two years. It's one of those games I keep coming back to to test where it is and how it's doing. And since its launch, it's been making steady progress in finding its identity. Not necessarily something you want to have happen in an MMO. It's something you want them to figure the hell out long before launching. But this is where we're at with new MMOs, I guess. It's becoming a story focused, quest focused MMO with PvP and survival elements attached to it. One thing it's always done well, though, is action combat. In fact, this is the only MMO I can think of where I actually didn't mind weapon swapping. It kind of just felt like it worked and it didn't feel too clumsy or clunky. Combat feels impactful and fun, while also limited in comparison to a game like BDO with all of its combos. It finds a nice middle ground and still has some of the best music, visuals and sound design of any MMO I've played recently. If only you could f***ing swim. Three great things and one bad thing about New World. Action Combat. The use of action combat style with a limited skill set by weapon that's tied to longer cooldowns is the kind of combat I didn't know I wanted. It's less frantic than Elder Scrolls Online's spammable skills, meaning you actually have time to think about whether you want to do a charge attack, position yourself, or hack away at something. It's a nice combination of action combat plus strategic combat. Although it's mostly just hacking away at things just a little bit slower 
than Elder Scrolls Online. Make sure you have a good mouse. Harvesting is one of the most satisfying things to do in game and actually leads to proper progression. You can level up all harvesting skills and crafting skills on a single character. Crafting is boring as hell, but it's still at least helpful. But the harvesting really has this beautiful sound design, which is the third part that I want to say. Sound design and graphics. New World at times can be a beautiful game, especially when you're looking at the sun coming down through the trees as it sets and the sound design really stands out as ring superb. This is a game worthy of being played with the sound on, which not many MMOs can say. The negatives of New World though are still pretty extensive. But the biggest issue I've had with New World since launch has been its direction, or lack thereof. They started out as a PvP survival game, then pivoted to PvP VE MMO, and now they're pivoting harder into PvE MMO, with a redesigned new player experience that's actually pretty damn fun to play through, and story quests that have a coherent line that did not exist for the first year plus. The lack of direction is evident across the game though, with systems that seem partially there but not all the way. Until they finish their years long direction change, the game will suffer, but at least they know where they're going now. Two years after launch, so in the next two years, we might have a complete MMO. This next section is going to be old MMOs and I am going to cheat. I am going to cheat with how many MMOs we're going to include, you know, because we're already about 40 minutes or so, 35 minutes, whatever the hell it is into this video. Might as well go long on this one. Three MMOs that are old school and you should check out. We're going to start with Ultima Online, but not just Ultima Online. Ultima Online Outlands, a private server. Ultima Online was my first MMO ever. Outlands is a private server version of that game that customizes much of what Ultima Online was, right down to the NPCs, skills, and the map itself. Even with all that customization, it would still feel like Ultima Online. I recently hopped into Outlands and found a few highlights of the game which made me put it ahead of the traditional Ultima Online from EA and Broadsword. It's easier to get started than the regular UO client. It's heavily focused on PvP using a rule set that opens you up to being attacked out in the open, just like PreachML. So if you want a hardcore MMO where you'll lose all your shit when you die, this is gonna be it. Combat can of course be a bit slower and more fun, like more basic because it is still based off a very old MMO, but it has a vibrant PvP scene and server administrators who are dedicated in putting out new content for the server. Yule Outlands is a great bet for this game. Three great things and one bad thing about Yule Outlands. Hardcore PvP and PvE for those that want that. It is high risk and high reward. It is a sandbox style gameplay with housing, crafting, gathering skills, and combat all rolled into one, kind of like what MMOs used to be. And with that, it has diverse varieties of playstyle. You can be a blacksmith, you could build furniture, you could slay dragons, you could hunt player killers, or be the murderous bastard yourself. It's all possible in Ultima Online Outlands. The negative has to be the limitations of a game that was made in 1997. The UI, while improved from what it used to be with lots of helpful tooltips and quality of life improvements from Outlands, is still old. You still have to make macros in game to form action, so there's a ton of setup to enjoy the game efficiently. It is going to take a dedicated player to get in and enjoy the game and find the enjoyment in the game. I think like if you enjoy setting up Linux, then you probably would like Ultima Online. I don't know shit about Linux, but that made sense to me in my head. This next one, I don't think I could get away with not putting on this list, and we're gonna talk about RuneScape, specifically old school RuneScape. RuneScape is one game on this list I haven't played at all, and it's something I plan to rectify in the near future, especially with the necromancy skill being announced and potentially coming soon. There are two iterations of RuneScape, but for the purpose of this video and talking classic, we're talking about old school RuneScape. This game gets a nod because of its legacy and overall popularity. It is a huge game with a vibrant player base. Because I haven't played the MMO, I don't want to throw out any buzzwords about combat. Just know that RuneScape has a dedicated and passionate audience, so there's got to be something there for the game, right? I'll have to revisit this and have it a try eventually, but for the meantime, I'll just continue watching other people play RuneScape. I'm going to bow out on commenting on RuneScape's positive and negatives for those same reasons. I have not played the game, so I cannot pinpoint things that are really good about it or really bad about it. It does, however, have a 
wide system of older older set systems and they're continuously adding content and they, they have all different types of skills that you level up in different ways but it is a broad game with questing sandbox skills all kinds of things it just feels like a massive game and one that i'm very eager to try in the future but i want to crowdsource this to you many of you have probably played runescape what are three good things about runescape and one bad let us know down in the comment section below. So remember I said that we would get to P99? This is the point where we get to P99 because I feel like it fits classic better than just saying social. EverQuest today, even on progression servers, is not the same as it once was. It is still a very social MMO and is full of difficult group and raid content, but it is nothing in comparison to what it was in 1999. Project 99 is an emulator for EverQuest that is officially recognized by Darkpaw. They have three different servers, including one that is a PvP server, and they don't allow boxing. That is the process of playing multiple characters to make your own group, which makes it even more important to group with others, being social. If you want EverQuest without the modern trappings, P99 is going to be the classic experience you're looking for. Go into it expecting to grind NPCs for experience, not doing quests. Here are three great things about EverQuest P99 and one not so great. It is a true social experience with difficult PvE. And that sounds like two things, but it, it really fits in as one thing because the heart of EverQuest when it first launched and the heart of P99 is working together with others towards a, a challenging PvE. And EverQuest when it first launched was a lot more difficult than it is today. And EverQuest today is still a fairly difficult game. The second is going to be kind of a cop out here, but nostalgia. It is nostalgia for anyone who played EverQuest in the early days. This is going to be the most reminiscent experience of that gameplay back in the early days of EverQuest, before, before the Freeport revamp. And if you played EverQuest, you know just how bad that shit was. It also has some of the best vertical PvE progression you'll see in an MMO. It kind of laid the groundwork for how to do it with gear progression, level progression, strength progression, spell progression. There's so many different things that go into the game that make you feel like you're getting more and more powerful as you level up and as you gain gear. It is that traditional RPG experience in MMO form. The negative here is going to be for players who don't have a lot of time or more accustomed to faster paced games. EverQuest as it was will feel slow. Hell, EverQuest before the Serpent Spine will feel slow to many players. For people who love P99, this is actually part of the point of playing it. But for others just trying it out, it's something to be aware of. The game will be slower. As we round out these lists, I wanted to give a nod to some kickstarted MMOs. Kickstarted MMOs being like kind of the indie MMOs that have at least launched. Those are the ones that I'm talking about here, the ones that are on their way to being games that have delivered on their promise. Embers Adrift is a PvE focused low fantasy MMORPG that launched last year. They recently made changes to a buy to play MMO with an optional subscription, easing up access to the game. This is an MMO that is difficult, especially solo, so it could very easily have slotted into the social MMO side of things. It's built in Unity Engine and since launch has steadily been releasing new content, making improvements and working toward making the game better for its fans. If you want a hardcore PvE MO experience, I highly recommend checking out Embers Adrift. My one gripe with it is it remains limited in scope by sticking to just humans, a similar gripe I have to some other MMOs on this list like New World. But perhaps more importantly, it lacks direct magic, instead utilizing a sort of alchemy system, which feels novel but is just isn't it for me personally. Here are three great things and one bad thing about Embers Adrift. It has a dedicated development team that is constantly adding in new content or improving performance since launch. It is buy to play with optional sub, which makes it easy to jump into the game and give it a try. It's hardcore PVE provides a challenge that is rare to see among modern MMOs, making every encounter dangerous. But the negative has to be the scope. This is an indie MMO and it does show. They have done a tremendous amount of work, but if you're expecting a triple A experience, you'll likely be disappointed. 
go into it with the same mindset as P99, Ultima Online Outlands, or other smaller team MMOs and private servers, and you'll probably be happier. Did you know that Albion Online was a kickstarted MMO? The PvP isometric game continues to thrive since its launch in 2017, providing that indie MMOs can be viable under certain circumstances. Albion Online is a game I've jumped into from time to time, and I've always enjoyed my time in the game. While focused primarily on PvP, the game doesn't lack for PvE opportunities either. One of the most interesting parts of this game is that your gear is what defines you. Gear that you gathered for and crafted. Gear that can be dropped when you die. These focuses always made Albion Online feel like an updated version of Ultima Online to me. The high risk, high reward focus on open world PvP gathering, crafting, and the like. The game is also cross-platform, meaning you can play it on PC and mobile without losing progress. The UI definitely leans towards being mobile friendly, but it's still a pleasant experience on PC. There are three great things and one not so great about Albion Online. PvP in a sea of PvE games. Albion Online provides a healthy option for players who want to engage in PvP. It also runs very well. Every time I picked up Albion to play it, I found their performance to be excellent even on my old shitty computer. And finally, it just feels fun. There's something about running around harvesting, doing different activities in the game that just feels right. Honestly, I probably need to play the game some more to, to really get an experience of what it is that's making it feel that way, but it feels solid, kind of like how World of Warcraft's combat just felt right. Like it's like a combination of the right amount of latency and the right amount of graphics and things like that. It's just like a good, a good mixture. The negative for me though is going to be the inclusion of mobile. Like I mentioned, it is crossplay. It is crossplay with mobile, and the UI is mobile friendly, which may be kind of a turnoff for some players. It feels a bit simplistic for a PC game at times. I wanted to end with an honorable mention section, and I was going to include Archage. I had a whole write up of Archage, but with the possibility that Archage might be actually closing soon. I figured that might be a wait and see kind of thing for that game. So let's jump over to a different game that is actually just starting their closed beta, Palia. Palia promises to be a unique entry into the MMO space. Palia is a cozy open world MMO that focuses on the same kind of things you might find in games like Stardew Valley. A social simulation with core gameplay loop consisting of developing myriads of skills like hunting, bug catching, cooking, mining, fishing, crafting furniture, all to build for your own comfy little home. It's a social cooperative MMO that wants to create a sense of community and belonging. Palia will have some combat, but it won't be a key feature of the game and it certainly won't involve PvP. If you're looking for something completely different, check out Palia linked below and see if it's the game that's right for you. I guess that's it, right? Like I, there's nothing else that I have to do like at all. There's there's no other things that I need to mention at all. Like I, I think we can just end the video here, right? Project Gorgon is an Elmo I don't know much about, but Marauding Llama would be very upset if I didn't include it in this video and I'm nothing if I'm not here for all of you. Project Gorgon is an indie MMO from Elder Game Studios, a sweet story of a husband and wife duo who made an MMO, both of whom have an extensive MMO creation experience having worked in key positions on games like Asheron's Call, EverQuest 2, and Star Trek Online. It is an exploration-centric MMO that doesn't have predetermined classes, but rather skills boasting 16 different combat skills, a whopping 71 trade skills, and 11 beast skills. They promise an immersive experience with an intricate combat system complete with freaking animal morphing. Project Gorgon is an early access game on sale on Steam for $40 as well as a free playable demo to see if it's something you want to spend 40 freaking dollars on. It is a very, very retro style MMO, if the graphics didn't give it away, and it has a clear focus on PvE with no PvP. It's hard to put Project Gorgon in a box, and having only played it briefly, I'll just say, go try the demo. Of the games on this list, Project Gorgon is probably going to be the most unique. It is still heavily in development and is far from mainstream, but the fact that it's made by two people and has a dedicated niche community makes it worth including on this list. And because I'm Rotting Llama. Now, without going into too many spoilers here, I want to talk about some of the skills you can learn in Project Gorgon as listed by Massively OP. Dying. Yep, I mean, I guess this is a skill I'd be pretty damn good at in most games, but you can get better at dying. Psychology, beast speech, art history, poetry appreciation, 
and compassion. I wonder if World of Warcraft had a compassion skill. Would you immediately get a debuff the moment you use the, the looking for raid or looking for group tool? I think you definitely would in battlegrounds or arenas. Now, there are a lot of other MMOs I could have included on this list, but the script was over 5,000 words. And as you can tell by the end of this video, which if you're still here, holy crap, thank you. Please hit the like button because I spent an entire evening just recording this. But <laughs> there's a lot more I could have added, but I had to put it, I had to cut it off somewhere. So if there's a game that I didn't mention that you think is fantastic and you want to tell other people's about, please put it in the comment section below. Let people know what world you are inhabiting and let them in, let them join you in that game. If it was Star Wars Galaxies or Star Wars The Old Republic or Lost Ark or some other thing or EVE Online, you know, I really should have included EVE Online. I realized that I should have included EVE Online. I'm sorry to anyone who plays it. My name is Redbird Flynn. I am tired. I'm gonna go get some water from my throat. Thank you so much for watching this video and I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day.